In his famous book, The Faith of Scientists, John Polkinghorne says, although we are rightly impressed by the many things that science can account for satisfactorily, we should also recognize that this great success has been purchased by a degree of modesty of ambition. Science limits itself to only certain kinds of experience, and he is right. Not everything can be explained by science. And while we are in awe of the advances of science, it is not the end all, be all. And in fact, some experiences fly in the face of science. We have a term for these experiences. We call them miracles. Do you believe that miracles can happen? Or do you confine your experiences and beliefs to the limits of science, which can explain vast amounts of things about the world, but not everything? In other words, do you believe God for the impossible? Do you believe that He can do the impossible? Do you believe that He can make something happen against all odds? That what He does is not confined to the limits of the physical world? So often as Christians, we try to explain Christianity in pragmatic, even scientific terms. We try to make the case that the Bible does coincide with scientific findings, and it does. And we try to use logic and apologetics to convince people that Christianity is a logical and reasonable faith, and it is. But it is more than that. It is so, so much more than that. In fact, if you believe the basics of Christianity, you already believe that God is so much more than the practical, pragmatic, logical God we've made Him out to be. Remember Jesus on the cross? Why does that matter to us so much? We believe that our sins were placed on Jesus on the cross. We believe that the sin of the entire world was placed on Him as He sacrificed Himself for the people He loved. But how did the sin of the world get there? What happened that caused the sin and guilt of people's past, present, and future to be somehow placed on Jesus at the cross? Something miraculous happened, and it was so. We do not argue for a scientific answer for this because we know there isn't one, and yet we believe it. Because we believe that our God is the God of the impossible. How is it possible for an innocent man to suddenly take on the sins of the whole world? In worldly terms, it is not, but with God, it was possible, and it happened, and it saved the world from destruction and gave us all a chance to know God and be with Him forever. After that, yet another miracle happened, the greatest yet. Jesus was laid in a tomb for three days and He rose again. We don't know exactly what happened during those three days. That is clouded in mystery. But we know that Jesus appeared to His followers after His body had been in the tomb for three days. Is there a practical, scientific answer for the resurrection? Of course not, but we believe it happened, and it altered the course of history forever. If God can perform these miracles, what makes you think He will stop? If He can do the impossible work of removing your sin from you and placing it on Jesus, why do you doubt Him? If He can raise His Son from the dead and conquer death, why are you skeptical that He can do the impossible for you? God has done the impossible and He will continue to do the impossible. The real question is, do you trust Him? Do you believe that He can do the impossible in your life? Do you believe that He wants to? We live in a tragically pragmatic era. With the Age of Enlightenment came the scientific era. Many people believe that if something cannot be explained by science, then it simply isn't true or doesn't exist. But God has never been bound by the limits of science. He can and does perform miracles. When God promised Abraham that he would have a son, it was not scientifically possible. To this day, we cannot explain how a 100-year-old woman conceived and bore a child, but we believe that it happened. Abraham believed God before there was any evidence of Sarah being pregnant. Can you imagine having that kind of faith? Imagine you are 100 years old and you have no children with your wife. Sarah, who is also 100, Imagine then that God gave to you and told you that you would have a son by your elderly wife. Would you believe him? Would you trust that it would be as God had said? Abraham had never seen anything like this happen before. I imagine he had known plenty of elderly women and was well aware that they did not conceive at that age. He had never seen it happen before. He had no reason to believe that it would happen, except that God told him that it would, and he believed. Trusting God to do the impossible in your life is an essential element of a true walk with Jesus. This does not mean that you will get everything you want. 
that you will wake up with a million dollars in your bank account or a new car in the driveway. It doesn't even mean necessarily that you will be healed from an illness. Now, these things can happen because God can do the impossible, but they will not necessarily happen just because you believe that they will. In other words, believing God for the impossible does not mean that we get to dictate to Him the impossible things we want, and He has to perform the miracles to oblige us. God is not a genie. He isn't controlled by our requests of belief. Believing in God for the impossible means that we trust that God can do miracles in our lives according to His will. And if we are walking with Him, we want nothing more and nothing less than His will to be done in our lives. So we surrender our will to His greater will, and we trust Him that He will do impossible things in our lives if we will go with Him. Maybe you've wanted to trust God to do the impossible, but you just don't know how to believe. Trusting God to do impossible things in your life starts with looking inward. It's easy to look outside of us and wonder what miracles God might do or to dream that God might miraculously change our circumstances or something else in our outer world. And he does that. But it starts with taking a look inside our own heart and inviting Jesus to do a miracle there. God does some great miracles, but some of the greatest happen when he changes a human heart. You have probably heard someone say, People don't change. Maybe they've been hardened by life or they've trusted people and had their hearts broken. But when someone says this, it usually means they have had enough experience with humanity to understand the impossibility of the human heart changing. But that is exactly what God does. The miracles and the impossible things that He wants to do in your life start in your heart. It starts when you are willing to stop and take a look at your own heart, invite Jesus in, and ask Him what miracles He wants to perform there. Spiritual changes that take place in a person when he trusts Jesus to change his own heart. And these changes are nothing short of miraculous. To this day, the only well-documented evidence of a cure to addiction is spiritual revival. Thousands of rehabilitation centers across the globe have incredibly low success rates, and yet when people who have overcome addiction speak about it, nearly all of them credit spiritual revival. They say they found God. They began to have new meaning in their lives. They had a power outside of themselves which entered them and conquered the addiction. And we all have addictions, don't we? Maybe they aren't all substance related, but we all have them. Some of us are addicted to success or approval. We need a cure as much as anyone, and that cure can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in our hearts to conquer an addiction is nothing short of a miracle. God begins doing impossible things in the secret places of our hearts, and the miracle of a changed heart is one that keeps on working. He continues to change us, heal us, and grow us through the power of the Holy Spirit, and you can become someone you never dreamed you could become. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in your heart, doing miracles in your soul, you can become someone you never thought you could be. You can be and do the impossible through the power of the Holy Spirit continuing His miraculous work in your heart. Romans 15, 18 through 19 says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Paul knew that any signs and wonders he performed was Christ working miraculously through him. God did impossible things through Paul. It says in Acts 19, 11 through 12, that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. But even these wondrous signs started with the miracles that happened in Paul's heart. God did the impossible by talking to Paul through a donkey. But the even more impossible thing was that Paul's heart changed. He was a man who was once so filled with hatred that he hunted down followers of Jesus to persecute and kill him. That same man then went out into all the world performing miracles in the name of Jesus and leading people to faith in him. What is the most astonishing miracle in this story? Was it that evil spirits were cast out and people were healed? Or is it more miraculous that the heart of a hateful murderer was transformed into the heart of a servant? It all starts in your heart. 
If you will give God your heart, He will do the impossible. He will change you and then use you to change the world. It is very human to want to fix broken things and fight battles. It is human to want to do a lot of things, like feeling and reacting. But we almost always fail to understand that we get these attributes from God. God, too, wants to fix broken things, literally and otherwise. Now, while God doesn't have to struggle to get things done, we sometimes have to. So what do you do when you hit a dead end? What do you do when all the tricks in the book fail? What do you do when there's no logical answer? What do you do when human options fail? Have you lost your direction? Has the enemy surrounded you and you don't know what to do? Stand still. God wants us to be able to look beyond what our eyes can see and what our ears can hear and praise Him in the midst of our trials. This is how we invite God into the situation. Psalms 22.3 says, Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. The psalmist here was in great trouble. He was afraid and he'd come to the end of the road. His enemies were mocking him and the fact that he served the Lord. But in verse 3, he acknowledges God, his holiness and his might. God wants us to be able to see Him above all else. I may be going through the wilderness, but I will confess that He is holy. I may be looking for a job, but I proclaim that He's faithful. I may be stuck in a spot, but I will praise Him. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were chained, and there was no way out. People who hated them were across their cells. They had to listen to mockery and hate speeches all day and all night. They were going to die. But the Bible says of these men who should be hopeless that they prayed and sang. They sang. They sang songs of praise, hymns of rejoicing, melodies of worship. They sang and sang until God had to come down, causing an earthquake, and release them. In the midst of the late nights crying in the stacks of bills, in the midst of the breakup and the project failure. God wants you to remember that you're not alone. He wants you to see Him and let Him fight your battles. I believe that we should be rather quick to let God step in. I mean, He's never lost a battle, so why not let Him fight yours? If you can employ a tutor to help you with math and a butler to help you with house duties, then why can't you employ God to fight your battles? Child of God, don't struggle alone. Stand still. Let God fight your battles. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat and all of Israel were faced with a great multitude of the enemy. He didn't know what to do. They couldn't fight and win. He was afraid. So he declared a fast and gathered the people of Israel. Then he began to pray, saying, O Yahweh, God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven? Now you rule in all the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand are power and might, and there is none who can resist against you. He goes on and on, praising and reminding God of his might and power. Then in verse 15, God spoke through Jehaziel, saying, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says Yahweh to you, Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed before this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. This is God's word to someone today. God is reminding you that the battle isn't yours, but His. You are not meant to fight. You are not meant to deal with rejections, frustrations, attacks, anger on your own. God is meant to fight for you, and He wants to. God wants to step in and give you action plans. God wants to converse and show the way out. So let Him just stand still. Stop breaking your back trying to do God's work for Him. Stop trying to prove you're strong enough, because you're not. Your strength is nothing compared to God's. Your wisdom will fail. So if you're like King Jehoshaphat, please go to the Lord when the enemy comes. Remind Him of who He is. Praise like the enemy isn't outside the door. 
Then stand still and see God swallow depression up. See God kick frustration out the door. See the Lord fight and give you victory. Life is full of problems. Every day presents its own troubles. Everyone we see is going through one thing or the other. Your homeroom teacher, your colleague at work, your boss, the president, the baker down the street, your brother, your aunt, your father, even you. Life's struggles are what make life worth living. As a man on earth, you're going to go through trials. You're going to struggle over certain things. And the problem is, we always enter into our shells when the problems come knocking on the door. We always try to fix our problems, and we get frustrated and depressed when our strength and wisdom fail us. All the noise, all the repetitive problems, and how people are so untrustworthy these days has made us not want to share our problems, not with man and not with God. Because man has failed us before, we refuse to share or show a hint of vulnerability. And sometimes that's okay. But we've also asked the Lord our help sometimes, and He was quiet. So we've taken a silence for negligence. But God isn't so. He'll never ignore us. If He's ever been quiet before, it only means you didn't hear how He spoke at that time. He might have been trying to show you something, but your busy mind couldn't let you. That's why today I've come to tell you to be still. It is only then that you will hear God's subtle and loud responses. You need to be open to trusting God more. He won't tell you or rat you out to the world. He will listen, comfort, and help you. He is the one with who we can be unashamed. He's the one we can show our scars and share our secrets. He is saying to you today, Come to me, all those who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Is the load you carry too heavy for you? Have you spent yourself trying to make things right? Are you lost and exhausted? Do you need someone who can unload your baggage? Are the struggles of life eating you up? Come to Jesus. We have a Redeemer, a Savior, a Helper, and a Friend in Him. He wants to lift the heavy weight for us, he wants to pick up the pieces, unload our burdens, hold us tight and be there for us. We have so much in Jesus, yet we don't take advantage of him. Jesus' sacrifice was so we wouldn't feel pain anymore. It was so we could rest while he fights for us. It was so we could have a refuge to run to when life has beaten us up and we're injured. It was so we wouldn't struggle alone. But we keep shutting him out ignoring his call and not asking him for things that are pretty much our entitlement. Don't shut him out anymore. Don't be lonely anymore. Don't be in pain. Don't try to clean up the bruises and still go out to fight. Let it go and let God have his way. God wants to help, but we don't let him. We think that we are equal to the task. We think we can do it on our own. We think we don't need anybody's help, but without God, the struggles will continue, and so will the pain and the loss. Without God, we will fail, and we will lose. I think it's time for a change, because you've tried your strength, and it didn't work. You've tried consulting others, and you still got no answers. You've tried late nights and multiple applications, and you've gotten nowhere. So why don't you give God a chance? Let Him do it this time. When the people of Israel left Egypt, they got to a point where they had the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. They were going to die. There was no hope for them. But God told Moses that he would fight for them, that they only need to be still. You see, when human logic fails, God's way triumphs. What he says, he will do. It's a fact. His word can't return void. Moses declared to the people that they should stand still and watch the Lord. He lifted up his staff and he parted the sea. A miracle out of nowhere. And the people of Israel walked on dry land. The same way out of destruction for the Israelites was the way into death for the Egyptian army. For as they pursued, the sea swallowed them up. The way God will do it 
will be mind-blowing. The way God fights is different from how we fight. We fight and lose because we don't see the full picture, but God sees all. We fight and bleed because we are humans, but God owns the universe. The same God who parted the sea for the Israelites is the same God who's asking you to be still and let him. It doesn't matter what you need. Do you need the sun to stand still? God has done it before and he will do it again. Do you need to escape from prison like Paul and Silas? God can shake the prison. Do you need to recover all like David? God is ready to fight for you. Do you need the sea parted like the Israelites? God can do it. There is absolutely nothing he cannot do. His might, his power, his grace, his holiness, and the testimonies of all his attributes recorded in the Bible experienced by men is only an indication that God can do all things. Jeremiah 32:27 says, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? This is God's word. He will certainly do it. So just stand still and let God be God over your affairs. Stand still and let God fight your battles. He will deliver victory to your hands at no cost. We live in a prosperous society, and sometimes we can feel entitled to whatever we want. We think if we want something, there must be a way to get it, and sometimes that works. Hard work and effort can yield desirable results. But what about those times when God just says no? It can feel desperate when you want something so badly, and all you can hear is deafening silence. It can feel like God doesn't care anymore, like He isn't there to hear your prayers like he's turned his back on you. But he hasn't. He never has, and he never will. And when you feel this way, like God has shut a door, you were desperately hoping he would open. Don't forget that even Jesus felt the pain of hearing the answer, no, from his Father. Remember, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 38 through 39, Jesus himself desperately seeks his Father, he said to his disciples, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus asked God whether there was another way for his plan to be carried out in the world. He knew the pain of loneliness that was about to come over him, and being fully human, he felt it to his core. But his willingness to do his Father's will was never shaken. He remained steadfast, though he asked God whether there was any other way, whether that cup could pass from him. But at the end of that prayer, even though he was in the deepest sorrow and anguish, he surrendered his will to the will of his Father, thereby setting an example to all who would follow him what it means to surrender your will to your God. What do you do when God shuts a door you want it open? Do you try to pry it back open with fingers bleeding and heart aching? Or do you surrender your will to the will of God, no matter how much it hurts? God doesn't say no to us for no reason. He doesn't shut doors just to teach us a lesson or to punish us. God's plan is so much bigger than that. You see, God can see the whole picture. He can see everything that you can't see. And he loves you so much that he is willing to shut doors you wanted open so that you can see a better path. One that he knows will lead you to greater joy and purpose. His plans are better than ours. His ways are higher than ours. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Do you believe that your heavenly Father has good and perfect gifts in store for you? Do you believe that He delights in giving them to you? If you can begin to understand the way God delights over you, you may be more able to let go and accept it when He says no. You see, if you see God only as a judgmental being who administers punishment, you will not be able to embrace it when He closes a door. You may grow resentful and blame yourself or God. 
You may pine over the opportunities that were lost without ever opening your eyes to see the ones that God has placed right in front of you. If you can begin to understand God as the giver of all good things and as a father who is delighting in you, his precious child, then you may be able to accept it when he closes a door. If you truly understand that God wants all the best for you, then when he says no, you can accept that God is something bigger and better in store for you, that he knows you better than you know yourself, and that he can see the whole picture, all the things you cannot see. And in that knowledge, you can trust him that even though he shut a door you wanted open, he has a reason and a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Sometimes when God says no to something we want, it is because he knows what is in store for us, and he knows that his plans are so much better for us. Imagine you applied for a high paying job you badly wanted and you didn't get the job. You prayed for this job. You gave everything you had to get it. Still, God said no. Does this mean that God will then open a door to a better, even higher paying job? Maybe. It has happened to people before, but not necessarily. Maybe God has something even better in store for you than high pay. Maybe through financial struggle, he will teach you to trust and hope even in hard times. It is possible that those two virtues will bless your life more than any amount of money could have. Whether God says no, there is a certain amount of suffering involved. When we want something, it hurts not to get it. Proverbs 13, 12 admits this, saying, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. God's plan in saying no is not to make your heart sick, but he knows that you will suffer when your dreams die. He works in and through that suffering, and while he works in you as you draw near to him, he begins working with you to help you build a new dream, the dream that he has uniquely created for you. We cannot do everything, can we? There is not enough time in our short lives to do it all. There are a million things we could pursue, but we must choose. And God seems to give us a lot of freedom to choose. And yet, and yet, he has also created us for something bigger than ourselves. And in order to fulfill the role we were created to play, we must grow into the person God has uniquely created us to be. In order to pick up the cross that God has given to you to carry, you must make sure you are not already carrying something else. When you are already carrying something else, sometimes God has to ask you to put that down. Sometimes he has to take that thing from you, gently or otherwise, so that he can show you the cross he has asked you to pick up. And the cross he has asked you to carry is one that you can carry well. You have what it takes to carry that cross because it was made for you and you for it. We all have God-given limitations, and there is a freedom that comes with embracing those limitations. We'd like to think we can all do whatever we want as long as we set our minds to it, but that isn't the case. We all have different mental, physical, and even emotional abilities. We are not all the same. Where one person is weak, another is strong. Elon Musk was never going to be a star quarterback, and Aaron Rodgers was never going to found SpaceX. That doesn't mean that Rodgers isn't smart or that Musk couldn't play a pickup game of football, but God created them differently with different strengths and interests. We all have limitations, and they are for our own good. Imagine if you were the best at everything. How would you ever know what to pursue? God created you with both talents and limitations to help guide you in your journey of becoming fully the person he created you to be. Those limitations in our lives can be God's way of saying no or shutting a door on a dream so that he can guide us toward another, one he has created us for. We all have plans and dreams and hopes, and that's okay. God gave you a vivid imagination, and he wants you to use it. He made you full of hopes and dreams, and he wants you to go after them. He knows that he will say yes to some of your pursuits and no to others. He knows that through this, he is molding you and shaping you into the person he designed you to be. He knows that when he opens a door, your heart will be full of wonder and gladness. 
He knows that when he shuts a door, you will grieve that loss. And through it all, he continues to sanctify you, to grow you, and to draw near to you. So, when you want something badly, and you realize that God has shut that door, remember that he is a God who loves to give good gifts. Keep in mind that he is not punishing you, but guiding you. And trust that his plans for you are good. Grieve the loss. Let God know how you feel about it. He can handle it. Remember Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows what it feels like to hear no from the Father. So grieve knowing that your Savior understands your sorrow, but then surrender your will. Just like Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. When you really believe that God has your best in mind, it is easier to surrender your inferior will to his superior will. And then, as you begin to heal from the loss and the sorrow, lift up your head and look around. Ask God what doors he has opened for you and follow him. There will be many open doors and many closed doors on this journey. You will hear yes and no many times and in many different ways. But always remember that you are following the Savior who gave his life for you at the cross and living by the power of the Holy Spirit in you, surrendered to your God and Father in heaven. Ultimately, this will lead to the most wonderful and fulfilling life you can imagine. One day, you may even look back and be thankful for the times when God said no, because all of those closed doors led you to another open door and helped shape you into the person you became. In the midst of the storm, in the heart of the hurricane, say thank you. The power of gratitude is beyond what meets the eye. It's a lot more than just saying thank you. It's a pillar of communication between God and man. It's the special connection that uplifts our spirit and changes the way we truly see God. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. A lot of times we hear this, but we don't really listen. Count your blessings. Not once, not twice, not only when things are good. And then when everything starts to fall apart, you cry, God, where are you? Count your blessings, always. We're so focused on the things we don't have that we don't appreciate the things we already have. Fear and sadness come with complaint, but joy comes with praise and thanksgiving. Most people find it hard to thank God because their attention is on how much their problem is and how little their blessings are. Maybe you don't have enough money. You don't have a car. You don't have shelter. You don't have food. And you don't have all the things possible to not have. But you know the one thing you do have? Life. As long as you're still breathing, there's hope. There is a future of greater good. Let the air you breathe ignite your hope. Say thank you. For the gratitude comes with a great river of blessings bestowed upon our lives. Luke 17, 11 to 19 talks about Jesus and the 10 lepers. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Jesus then asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Only one came back to the source of his healing. He appreciated the source, and he was completely restored. The other nine lepers probably saw it as a little miracle. But that one leper counted that little miracle as something big. It was his immediate response of thanksgiving that changed everything. Say thank you. For everything you've lost shall be restored. For our God is a giver, and he is not a man that he will hoard his blessings. Say thank you. For the little things you acknowledge is the breakthrough for greater things. James 1, 16 to 17 says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, 
who does not change like the shifting shadows. If God has blessed you once, he'll continue to bless you. He won't stop because he's a generous God that will never change. Say thank you to remind yourself that God will never let you down. It strengthens your faith and gives you hope that even if you don't have now, your blessings will find its way to you. Philippians 4, 6-7 tells us, Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request for God. If you noticed, the ten lepers stepped out in faith when Jesus told them to show themselves to the priests, but they didn't come back to thank Jesus for the healing they received. When you step out in faith and get blessings you desire, do you come back to say thank you to the source of your blessings? Or do you just get what you want and then walk away, and then come back only when you need something else? The one leper that came back did not ask for complete healing, but Jesus healed him because he came back. Say thank you, for it unleashes unexpected miracles that will turn your life around. The enemy has led us into thinking that God doesn't want us to have good things, but all the devil does is lie. God blessed Adam and Eve with the Garden of Eden. He blessed them with every tree and he gave them one instruction. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil told Eve that God was keeping something good away from her. She believed the devil's lie and it cost them the whole garden. If only Eve looked around and appreciated what God had already provided, she wouldn't have fallen. Say thank you. For the power of gratitude breaks the power the enemy has over our lives, and he knows that. That's why he's constantly reminding us of what we don't have. Jesus tells us in John 14.1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus knew that there will be times when our hearts will be troubled, and that's why he says, trust me. When your heart is troubled, run to your refuge, for he will give you peace. Enter his courts with praise and let your heart seek God with joy. Say thank you, because Psalms 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. He is with you wherever you go. Say thank you, for you will be favored and will never lack. Say thank you, for it renews your mind and draws your thoughts toward positive things and heavenly things. Say thank you always, because the power of gratitude unlocks unlimited blessings. Say thank you, because when gratitude reigns in your heart, peace will also reign. Say thank you, for it prepares us for what's coming. We expect it so we're filled with joy knowing that great things are coming. Say thank you, for in thanksgiving, we draw comfort. Say thank you, because the more we thank God, the more we see Him working in our lives. Whatever it is you need from God, come to Him with thanksgiving. Thank Him for what He has done and what He will continue to do. Hebrews 13, 15-16 Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruits of the lips that profess His name. And do not forget to do good and share with others. For with such sacrifice, God is pleased. Gratitude is testifying the goodness of the Lord in all circumstances. Your life of thanksgiving will inspire others to be grateful for even the smallest things. Doris Day said gratitude is riches, complaint is poverty. People who always complain never really stop complaining. They're never satisfied, and they don't see the bright side of gratitude. They're stuck in the dark of lack. We're so driven by the things we don't have, we lose sight of what has already been given. Thankful people always have something to be thankful for. Their thanksgiving never ends because the blessings never cease. Say thank you, for it encourages contentment and it gives you peace knowing that your provider will not withhold anything good from you. Psalms 84:12, For the Lord is a sun and shield, the Lord bestowed favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from them that walk uprightly. There's one thing the Israelites were really good at, and that's complaining. They complained every step of the way to the promised land. You can imagine how frustrating it was for God and also Moses to continue hearing their nagging and murmur. 
These people were set free from slavery and they complained about it. They complained about hunger, about water. On top of that, they turned against God to worship other gods. They'd rather worship a God who did nothing than worship a God who did everything. They were ungrateful to God because their minds were corrupted with negative thoughts. They were not content. They saw God's provision for them as his responsibility rather than his blessing. The Israelites would have made it to the promised land a lot sooner if their hearts were filled with gratitude. But God remained faithful and was always with them until they learned how to give thanks. He gave them a chance even when they didn't even give him a chance. God's mercy is filled with an abundant love we don't understand. Are you a good complainer? Well, we all are. But your intentional desire to have a heart of gratitude is what makes the difference. Say thank you, because even when we don't deserve it, God will always bless us. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks even when you don't feel like it, even when you're overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. Give thanks. For it is in thanksgiving we draw our strength. David was always thankful. In the chaos, he praised. In pain, he praised. In sorrow, he praised. In weakness, he praised. In heartache, he praised. In all circumstances, David praised because he knew that God will remain faithful. Thanksgiving is a great way David exercised faith. When you find yourself complaining, Find things to be grateful for. This will become a habit and from it, joy will continue to grow in your life. Say thank you because the things we desperately want lies in the praise that comes out of our mouths. Say thank you even when your future seems to be going on a rocky path because your shield and your fortress won't let you fall. Mary gave thanks when she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. She thanked God for the child she carried, Jesus. She trusted God that what had happened was a good thing and he wasn't going to abandon her. Even when she wasn't sure about what the future would hold, she gave thanks. She wasn't worried about the shame that came with having a child out of wedlock because she knew that God had great plans for her and her baby. Say thank you. Even if everything around you is a screaming chaos, Praise the name of the Lord, because the sacrifice of praise will make a way for peace. Even in dark times, God will pull you into the light. Say thank you. Even in uncertainty, there's a certainty in faith. Without faith, you will remain in lack and continue to complain your whole life. When you glorify the name of the Lord, you come to Him as you are, broken and shattered, and He will make you whole. The leper came as he was, and he was blessed, and he did not return the same. When you enter God's presence in pain, and you start to praise, he will not remain the same. Allow God to lead the course of your life. Let him sail your boat because he loves you so much, he will not let you down. So say thank you to a loving father who's not greedy and will give you more in abundance. Say thank you because we all have something to be grateful for. Suppose you love a person. What would you rather do? Would you want to get away from them as fast as you can and avoid them? Or would you want to spend time with them? The Christian life is not just a religion. It's a relationship with the living God. And as in any relationship, communication is key. And prayer is that method of communicating with God. Prayer is not one-dimensional. There is no compulsion to do it a certain way or only out loud. Sometimes when we don't know what to say, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us as in Romans 8.26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Prayer is a way to reach out of our realm and into the realm of the Almighty God. It is a powerful weapon in the arsenal of the Christian. 
Hudson Taylor, a great man of God, once said that the son has never seen him on his knees. He would spend much time in prayer even before the sun rose. He had spent so much time on his knees that even now, years after his death, the wooden floor where he knelt and prayed is worn in the shape of his knees. But those hours spent in prayer were as a life-giving elixir that strengthened him through his toils and labor in China. It is important to note that it is not the act of prayer itself that holds the power, but rather that the prayer is addressed to an all-powerful God. You needn't even say the words. God will hear even your soul's silent cry. The power of prayer lies in whom the prayer is addressed to. We must remember that when we pray, we address the one our faith is in. Prayer is called upon the one who made the universe, the one who hung the stars in the heavens, the one who placed planets in their orbits, the one who marked the boundaries for the sea, the one who so intricately wove our DNA in every single cell of our body, yet the one who listens to our every cry. The wonder of it all is expressed in Psalm 8:4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? In this world, the rich have no time for the poor. Those in power have no time for the downtrodden. But God has time for every single one of us. He wants to hear us. He yearns for us to talk to him, to call upon him, to spend time with him. Why? Because he loves us, individually, specially. Our relationship with God is a one-to-one -one relationship. What do we see in the Bible about the power of prayer? Jesus himself spoke about prayer and gave us assurance that he would answer it. In John 14, 13 to 14, he said, And whatever you may ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And this is a great promise. As a father involves himself in the life of his children, God is here, involving himself in our lives. As a father would want to provide only the best for his children and fulfill their every need and desire, God too wants to fulfill every need and desire of us, his children. The Bible clearly explains it in Luke 11:10 to 12. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? That is the love of God for us. The power of prayer also depends on the attitude and the faith of the person praying their prayer. One should not have a careless attitude when praying nor should there be disbelief, nor arrogance in demanding your own way, nor insecurity. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. There are two important words here in this verse. The first is supplication. Supplication means the act of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. Earnestness comes from truth. There should be truth and a deep conviction in our hearts when we pray. Our hearts should be laid bare before God. If there is sin hiding in any corner of our heart, then our prayer will not be effective. The Spirit of God will keep convicting us until we lay it before God and set things right with Him. The second is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the act of expression of gratitude. We need to express our gratitude to the Lord for hearing us and so graciously extending his hand to us. When we do not adopt an attitude of gratitude towards the Lord, how can he bless us? It is extremely important to give thanks to the Lord for every single thing in our lives. The very simple act of opening our eyes in the morning to wake up is a great gift that we all underestimate. It is the gift of life. It is the gift of time. It is a sign of God's mercy to us. 
everything that we see around us, our family, our friends, our home, our possessions. Have we acquired all this through our own strength? Is it really your talent of music that has made you famous? Is it really your talent of speaking that enabled you to mobilize millions for your cause? Is it really your hard work that built this company? The answer is a resounding no. There is no such thing as my talent, my hard work. It is God who graciously bestows us with various talents, with intelligence, with good physical health to hard work. We only use whatever He has chosen to give us. Hence, it is important to remember and give thanks to the Lord. What has prayer accomplished in this world? It was a mother's incessant prayer for her son that brought about a conversion in Hudson Taylor. This Hudson Taylor then went on to begin a great mission in China called the China Inland Mission. Through him, many souls were brought into the kingdom of God. When the son of the widow with whom Elisha took refuge died, it was an earnest prayer that brought him back to life. When the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman suffered being possessed by a demon, it was an earnest and humble prayer that delivered the poor child. When the nation of Israel languished in captivity, it was the humble prayer of Daniel that moved to the heart of God to prophesy freedom for the nation and the things to come. Prayer can accomplish mighty things if only we have faith. Jesus himself said in Matthew 17, 20, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The amount of faith required is so little, yet how often do we fall short of this requirement? We find that we do not even have faith as small as a mustard seed. And so, our prayers are not effective, and we lose our faith. The Bible also assures us in this manner in James 5.16, Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In this verse, we see a strong assurance about the effectiveness of prayer. Avails much means that much will be accomplished, but much will be achieved, much will be done. But there is a great condition to be met. The first half of the verse speaks clearly about confessions of sin. If things could be set right between men, then it should be set right. If things could be set right between a man and God, then it should be confessed to God. There should be true repentance in every sense of the word, feeling deeply sorry for your sin, then turning away from it. This is real repentance. When prayer follows repentance, there is great power in such prayer. This prayer is what will really make a difference in the life of any person. The next important point to note in this verse is the usage of the word fervent. This means that our prayer should have a burning, passionate intensity. It should not be neglected after a while, but we must make sure to continue in our prayer in order to see victory. It is very easy to give up praying after a short while when we do not see results, but often God makes us wait for His perfect timing. Though we are eager to get things done as fast as possible, when we wait for God's timing, we will see blessing. Let us remember that even our Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden Let us remember that even our Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden of Gethsemane in great agony with great passion and effervescence he knelt on the ground and poured out his soul before his heavenly father though he dreaded having to take on the sin of all mankind when he had known no sin he obediently submitted himself to the will of the father he pleaded humbly for the cup to be removed from him if possible, but in the end followed not his own will, but the will of his heavenly Father. He prayed not just for himself, but also for all those who had put their faith in him and had followed him to that point. He also prayed for those who would follow him in the future. In the midst of his agony, he remembered us and was thinking of us. This prayer was a beautiful prelude to the great mission which the Lord had to carry out on the cross an excruciating mission with a glorious end which would bring hope and everlasting life to all mankind. The Redemption of Our Souls 
Let us learn from the example that our Lord Jesus has set before us. Let us learn to be sincere, earnest, and humble in prayer, not being anxious in disbelief, but resting on his promises. Let us pray with a grateful heart. Let us strive to remove sin from our hearts that threaten to come between us and our Lord. And let us pray and witness the power of prayer manifested in our lives. It is good to have a support system of people who love you, support you, and push you towards all the things that are good in life. It is good to have people you can call on and people who can stand by you when life is not working out the way you want it to. But even though we crave these relationships, we mustn't place our trust on people 100%. We mustn't forget our worth and our abilities. We can't forget of the powers we have in Christ Jesus. We can't forget His promises. We mustn't forget God is the only one we can really rely on. The Bible clearly instructs us in Psalm 146.3, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. We know of the abilities of man, and we know of the abilities of God. The lives we live, the material things we have, are all from God. We know that God is the one who molded us in His image, and He is the only one who is able to give us life and freedom. On the other hand, all humanity is dependent on God. The same thing you are asking your fellow man to provide, we should be asking God. Dependency on man goes hand in hand with thinking someone can offer you all the things you need. Be it a partner, or a parent, or a sibling, we constantly catch ourselves thinking why the people around us don't please us to the fullest. We think of the better ways our parents could have raised us, or the ways our spouses could be better spouses. This ends up disappointing us. You know why we end up hurt? Because before we ask God, we ask man and we put our full trust in Him, forgetting that man is weak and unreliable. No one is able to satisfy the heart of man like God can. He is the only one who knows it, because He made it. No one could be there for the other all the time, because as humans, we still have a lot of neediness within us. The person you look to to take care of you also needs to be taken care of. The person you're looking up to for reassurance also needs reassuring. The person you are going to for comfort and hope has none to give. They need to be comforted themselves. Psalm 118, 8-9 reads, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Our dependence on man has gotten us to a place where we lack the confidence to think or make decisions for ourselves. Consider a child growing up in a well-off family. This child is used to receiving comments on what he should do with his life, so much so that when he reaches adulthood, he absolutely has no sense of individuality. God might have kept in this child a risk-taking nature so that he might become an entrepreneur. But his dependency on other people to dictate the way he progresses through his life might hinder him from doing so. How many of us await the comment of one particular person, be it in terms of our relationships or our careers, before we make a decision? We are constantly asking, what do you think? And we wait on the reply and take it as the manual to life, not using our own mental capabilities to analyze situations ourselves and make sound decisions. In trials, how many of us depend on other people to tell us how to tackle the problem or wait for them to come tackle the problem for us? 
We are in debt. So we wait for a family member to bail us out. We want to apply for a job, but we are waiting for a referral from a particular someone. We want to take a chance at starting out a new business, but we look for someone to hold our hands. It's not wrong to have mentors. It's not wrong to take advice from people who have passed the road that you're currently walking on. But you should not depend on these people as if your whole existence depends on it. We mustn't look to them and rely on them. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in salt land where no one lives. See, depending on man, is actually frowned upon by God, and it is bound to set up for even more disappointments. God is a jealous God. He will not have you look to another with the expectation and desire and dependency you should have reserved for Him. He will not have you worship at someone else's feet, begging this person and laying your life at their feet. God will not have you think that there is another solution to your problems other than Him. Human beings, compared to God, are fundamentally untrustworthy. While people must be trusted from time to time in everyday life, in the most important matters, however, we cannot afford to lean on the broken crutch of human aid. Ultimately, we are bound to be disappointed because people, even the most well-intentioned, will fail us. You know why? Because first, people are weak. Even the most powerful of men are limited in what they can do. Unlike God, they do not have sovereign control over people, nations, nature, or time. Their limitations make them inconsistent, unable to help when it is needed most. Second, men are mortal. Several of the other scriptures that warn us not to put our trust on other human beings mention that people are here today and gone tomorrow. For instance, the Bible says, Men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. And of course, because men live and die so quickly, they lack both the wisdom and the perspective to be trusted on the big questions of life. Only God has the eternal knowledge and experience to give us right help and answers we need. Finally, Human beings are unreliable. They blow hot and cold, as it were. They have self-interest that sometimes align with our own and other times do not. Princes, leaders, especially, do not have our best interests in mind, as they have not only personal desires, but also political goals to pursue. God, however, though the greatest leader in the universe, always does what is best for us. Moreover, he is always faithful to what he has promised, 1 Corinthians 1-9. through So if we go to him and ask him for help that he has pledged to us, he will give it. In Psalm 46, 1, the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. The only ever-present help in times of trouble is God. He is the only dependable one. His promise is that when He is within a person who depends on Him, that person will never fail because He will provide help at the break of day. We have only one source of security who is God, our Heavenly Father. When wars break out, government fails, natural disasters destroy our homes, our health deteriorates, or friends betray us, God is the only one where we can find security. God wants us to depend on Him, and we need to be aware that our trust should not be in things or other people, but only in Him. From this, the Bible shows us where to get help. 
It's not from within ourselves. It's not from our fellow men. It is from God. The psalmist says in Psalm 121, 1 through 8, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. For indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your whole life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. If we are looking for a place to run to when we are discouraged or disappointed, doesn't it make sense that we run to a reliable and dependable shoulder? Doesn't it make sense that we run to the person who promises he will not leave us nor forsake us? Doesn't it make sense that we look to God, not man? Running to our fellow man for help is like having a five-year-old who can't open a jar. We know their strength. They both can't open a tight jar, even if they try. It makes no sense to ask a grown-up whose strength is significantly more than the five-year-old's. I bet the Israelites know a heavy lot on the notion of depending on God. They were an infant nation with no trained armies or specialized weapon, but they saw the mighty hand of God fight their wars with great miracles. There were times when the enemies consumed them. Sometimes victory was achieved by the lifting of hands. Sometimes God supernaturally rose such fear in their enemies that they fled without knowing what scared them. Today, won't you shift your focus to God? When that bad news comes, before you make the call or even start the journey to go lament at someone's house, why don't you call God? Allow Him to be the peace you need, and from it you can draw many solutions for your problems. Before you force someone in referring you, I pray you get the kind of guts to stand alone, trusting that God is able to bring you much favor than any man can. Before you put pressure on your parents or your spouse, maybe you ought to realize they can't fully please you or be there for you. This will actually keep unnecessary pressures away from your relationships. And remember what Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. We have to realize that peace comes only from him, not from our fellow men.